Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This video will be a new story called Mai's Teacher. All credit goes to the author, Payne Seventeenification, for their amazing story. Make sure to read the whole story by clicking the link tree link in the description, then clicking on the name of this story. This part will be chapter 1 minus 2 of the story. Also don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Now let's get into this amazing story. Disappointment was felt by a blonde man as he watched another battle ensue from his perch on top of a hill in Mizu no Kuni. His azure eyes watched as shinobi pitted against shinobi, and blood painted the battlefield a deep crimson. Ever since the end of the Fourth Shinobi War, tensions had once again begun to rise between the shinobi villages of the elemental nations. It didn't take more than ten years before the tensions grew into skirmishes, and the skirmishes grew into full-blown battles. It was pathetic, really how easy it was to get caught up in another war so soon. Naruto Uzumaki sighed, as he kept observing the battle between Kirigakure and Kimogakure. Ever since the loss of Ai, the Yande Mrakage, and Karabi, the Hachibi Jinchuriki, Kumo had lost much of its military strength. They had noticed that Kiri had gotten noticeably stronger ever since the bloodline wielders returned to their old home in the mist. The Godai Mrakage was an unknown man who attained the seat through bribes and blackmail. He had decided that the need for restoring Kumo's military strength would be easily fulfilled by capturing and breeding any of the bloodline wielders they could capture. Kiri wasn't without loss, though. Mei, the Godame Mizukage, had fallen in combat. In fact, all of the previous Kage except for Gara, the Godame Kazakage, and Tsunade, the Godame Hokage, had lost their lives in the war as they faced off against the revived body of the Uchiha ancestor, Madara. Naruto took this time of silent observation to think back toward the Fourth War. The war itself was initiated by an Uchiha named Abito, a teammate of Kakashi Hataki and student of Minato Namikes. Abito Uchiha had assumed the role of Madara and fooled everyone into believing that he was the Uchiha ancestor before he was revealed to be an imposter. Others knew Abito as Tobi, the fool of the Akatsuki, who used his idiocy as a facade to hide his true role as the puppet master of the Dark Organization. Abito's identity had finally been unveiled in the middle of a battle against Naruto, Kakashi, Meidogai, and Karabi. Both Naruto and Karabi had the support of their respective Bijou, Kurama the Kyubi, and Gyuki the Hachibi, during the battle and utilized their abilities to the fullest. Karabi fought in his full Bijou form while Naruto used what he dubbed his Kyubi Sinin mode, and the six of them were able to give Abito a hard time. Unfortunately, the revived Madara appeared in the middle of the battle after killing three Kage, and incapacitating the other two, and began to fight alongside Abito. Madara went to fight the two Jinchuriki while Abito stayed to fight Kakashi and Gai. Naruto used every tactic, every jutsu, and every trick he had in his fight against Madara but was only able to barely keep up with him. Even with Karabi assisting him, it was a long and bitter fight. Madara had used his ultimate Manjiku Sharingan, Kaleidoscope Mirror Wheel Eye, Technique, Susanoo, Tempestuous God of Valor, to fight both Jinchuriki defensively and offensively at the same time. It was only by sheer dumb luck that Naruto was able to get the drop on the Uchiha. While Karabi distracted him with a Bijou Dama, Tail Beast Bullet, Naruto had pulled out a special seal tag provided by the Fuinjutsu Department of the Shinobi Alliance. The tag was meant to cut the connection between Kabuto and the people revived by the Edo Tensei, Impure Resurrection, technique. Kurama warned Naruto that the connection between Kabuto and Madara was no longer there and that he would have to pump the fox's yuki, demonic energy, into the seal to give it a higher chance to work. As soon as Madara was forced out of his Susanoo by the Bijou Dama, Naruto poured all of his chakra into his speed to appear in front of the Uchiha in a yellow flash, similar to how his father did in the past. He then slapped the seal tag on the undead Uchiha's torso, pumped as much of Kurama's yuki into it as he could, and activated the Tamashi no Mysofuian, Burial of the Soul Seal, in hopes of finally putting Madara to rest for good. At first, Madara believed that the seal would fail. However, when he felt his soul leaving the body it had currently inhabited, he realized that the Yuki was cutting off his chakra used to resist the seal by corroding his chakra coils. Before succumbing to his fate, Madara congratulated the blonde before using the remainder of his strength to have his Susanoo fire an arrow covered in the black flames of Amaterasu, illuminating heaven, at Karabi. The unexpected attack struck the wrapping Jinchuriki in his heart while in his full bijou form and began to engulf him in its undying black flames. Naruto watched on in horror as the man he both respected and befriended slowly burnt to death by the dark flames. How does it feel, Jinchuriki, to win this fight at the cost of another of your kind? This victory may be yours, 
but it will always be remembered as a hollow victory for you, Madara taunted before succumbing to the Tamashi no Mysofuian. The rest of the war was nothing but a blur for Naruto as the only thing he truly remembered after that fight was allowing Kurama to take full control of his body. After that, he remembered nothing else but rage for the loss of a dear friend. Kurama had explained that while he was in control, he was able to utilize all of his biju abilities, and some that Naruto was unable to handle at the time. The war had ended when Kurama slash Naruto fired what Kurama had called the Zedai no Biju Dama, Absolute Tailed Beast Bullet, at a Bito which Kakashi aided by using the remainder of his chakra to engulf it in a Kimui, Authority of the Gods, while Abito tried to use his own to make his body intangible. The result was Abito's body in the Ghetto Mazo, demonic statue of the Outer Path, being engulfed and obliterated by the technique which started the chain of events leading to the end of the war. With their leader dead, the Zetsu clones didn't know what to do and were overwhelmed by the Shinobi Alliance. However, Kakashi had lost his life performing his final Kamui and Kanoha mourned the loss of a great Shinobi as well as the many other Shinobi that they had lost. Those included were Rock Lee, Shino Aburame, and Ganma Shiranui. It was still unknown what happened to Sasuke, the reborn Orochimaru, and Team Taka after the end of the war. They had laid low over the years, and no one had even heard rumors of their whereabouts. It surprised everyone, especially Naruto's other teammate Sakura Haruno, that Naruto did not really care about Sasuke's disappearance, but he paid their surprise no mind. He had stopped planning to bring the Uchiha back during the war and figured that as long as Sasuke didn't choose to harm any of his precious people, then he wouldn't worry about the vengeful Uchiha. After the battle, Naruto had scoured the many battlefields for any survivors, and was pleased to see that his friend Anko had not only survived but had her Juin, Cursed Seal, removed. He was surprised at this discovery, as was Anko, but the woman was far too elated to care about details. Anko was finally free of her ex-mentor's influence and had surprised everyone by kissing Naruto in her moment of sheer joy. The reason why it was Naruto was that he was the one who had found her unconscious body and brought her back to Kanahaga Core. Of course, the kiss was just a spur-of-the-moment action, and the two remained nothing more than very close friends. Naruto shook out of his reminiscing before he activated his QB Sinin mode. Another day, another issue to settle? He sighed. Indeed it is, Kit. Agreed the fox inside the blonde seal as its host entered the fray. To the participants of the skirmish, Naruto was nothing more than an orange flicker as he took down battling shinobi left and right. To a spectator, it was like watching a bright orange flame move through the battle while countless shinobi were knocked aside. It was truly a sight to behold. As the self-appointed peacekeeper of the elemental nations, Naruto made it his duty to find peaceful ways to end disputes between the hidden villages. Of course, the job was far from easy and most of the time Naruto had to end the disputes forcefully, meaning that he would enter a battle and take down both sides. He avoided killing them and settled for incapacitating. However, his message to end the fighting was still given to both sides. Naruto knew that the idea of peace was becoming an empty dream at this point and decided that after this dispute, he would retire as a shinobi go into self-imposed exile. After all, one could only take so much stress before finally deciding that enough was enough. Plus, Naruto had one final plan in mind for the elemental nations. Hokage's office, one week later. Tsunade was busy with her never-ending battle against paperwork. Over the years, she still did not discover the secret to defeating it, and it pissed her off tremendously. She was interrupted by a knock on her door, and she inwardly thanked Kami for the distraction. Once she cleared the knocker to come in, the door opened to reveal Naruto. Naruto had changed over the years, and the changes were seen positively in the eyes of the villagers. He wore a pair of black a and style boots, maroon cargo pants, a black karate GI shirt with the sleeves torn off, had bandages covering from his fingers to his elbows, and his old Gama Sinin cloak. He also wore a straw hat with small bells like the Akatsuki used to wear, and constantly had a sanbon in his mouth like the Jonin Gunma hat. Because of the hat, his high eight headband, was wrapped around his left bicep which allowed his wild blonde hair to slightly cover his eyes. His hair was a blend of his father's, and Jiraiya's having his father's bangs and his godfather's ponytail. Many wondered why Naruto chose this as his attire and the reason was so that he could never forget the ordeals that he went through or the precious people that he lost. Naruto, it's good to see you, Gaki. What do you need from me? Questioned the blonde Kage. He still looks so young compared to everyone else, she thought to herself. True to her observation, Naruto appeared to have only aged by about one year. He assumed that Kyuubi was responsible since he still felt healthy, if not healthier. When brought to her attention years back, 
she was surprised to see that his body had seemed to stop aging due to the fox's yuki. It wasn't a total stop though, just a seriously slowed aging process. If she had to guess, Naruto would appear to age one year for every ten years that pass naturally. Naruto sighed before stating, Bachan, I'm ready to retire as a shinobi of Kanoha. Tsunade was shocked at his request. Why would you want to do that? I mean, wasn't it your dream to become Hokage of the Leaf one day? You can't become Hokage if you're retired, Naruto. Naruto merely gave her a blank stare at her outburst. I've given up on that dream years ago, Bachan. I let dozens of people rush to their deaths just for my sake, and they'll continue to do so if I become Hokage. I don't want their deaths weighing on my conscience, so I gave up that dream. What I want to do now is explore Kasan's old home, the ruins of Yuzushogakure. I can easily allow you to do that, and you can still remain a shinobi, she countered in hopes that he'd change his mind. She couldn't deny that his reasons for abandoning his dream were completely reasonable, but she refused to see him give up being a shinobi, the one thing that he enjoyed doing the most. I'm not just gonna visit Yuzu, Bachan. I'm gonna restore it. He saw the surprise on her face and elaborated. I wanna go back to my roots as an Uzumaki and see if there is anything worth scavenging. After that, I plan to slowly rebuild Yuzu and restore its old prestige as a shinobi nation. However, I can't do that as a Kanoha shinobi, so I've decided to retire. Besides, all of the constant arguments and disagreements between the other nations have really worn me out, and I can't handle it for much longer. If this keeps up, I might lose my mind and snap. Please, Bachan, just let me retire and go home, he pleaded. Tsunade was depressed that he called a place he had never seen his home besides Kanoha and was torn at her godson's request. He was well overdue for a visit to Yuzu, and she had planned on taking him there, but she was constantly busy with her duties as Kage of the Leaf. Not only that, but the war had made her forget all about taking him there, and his asking to retire had brought back that old plan to her thoughts. She also knew of his duties as peacekeeper and how much of a toll they had taken on him over the years. She saw the slight bags under his eyes from his stress and knew that he needed a rest. Perhaps retirement was the best alternative for her godson. She sighed sadly before she stated, All right, Naruto, I'll give you the retirement forms as well as clearance papers to leave Kanoha. No one will be able to stop you from leaving. But Naruto, is this really what you want? What about the rest of the Rookie Eleven? I'm sure they'll miss you if you go. Naruto smiled sadly at that comment. They all have their own lives and futures to deal with, Bachan. They all have families to care for, and I can't place myself back into their lives after not even seeing them for at least two years. And don't say it hasn't been that long because you know it has, he asserted when he noticed that she was about to interrupt. The point is that they don't need me in their lives anymore and the village doesn't need me either. They haven't needed me for over two years, and it won't change a thing if I leave for good. Yes, it will. The village will lose its ray of sunshine that brought me back, Tsunade said sadly with tears, threatening to leave her eyes. Naruto frowned at that before he walked over to her and enveloped her in a warm hug. She was initially surprised at his actions before she returned the embrace and shed a single tear. She would miss her godson terribly, and she knew Shizen would as well. Shizun and Naruto had a sibling relationship that seemed to outdo relationships between even blood siblings. Everyone could see how close they were during their interactions around the village. She was currently working her shift at the hospital and would be devastated once she heard the news of Naruto retiring. After they separated from the hug, Tsunade pulled out the retirement forms and a pass to leave Kanoha. Naruto quickly filled out the forms, handed them to Tsunade in exchange for the pass, and gave her one last hug before he left her office. Once he was outside the door, Tsunade shed one more tear at his departure. Good luck, Naruto, she whispered to the empty office. With Naruto, the blonde was currently heading for his apartment complex for the last time. Many people who saw him in the village paid him no mind and just went about their business. Even if Naruto was revered as the hero of the flame, there were some who still gave him nothing more than a passing glance. He was just about to pass Ichiraka Ramen before he stopped and decided to say his farewells to the father slash daughter duo. He entered the stand to see it looking the same as it always had. The large counter, many stools, and few customers that were finishing up their bowls of noodles. He smiled softly at the many memories he had in this very stand with Aruka, Jiraiya, and the two Ichiraku chefs. Speaking of the Ichiraku duo, I am noticed him enter and gave him a wide smile before running around the counter and enveloping him in a hug. He returned the happy embrace while offering a smile and greeting to Tucci who was observing them from behind the counter. After releasing him, Ayam said, It's so good to see you again, Narada. 
It's been too long. It's good to see you too, I am Chan. However, this isn't just a social visit. There's something I have to tell you and Tuchijiji. The two were curious about what he had to say, but they merely waited for him to speak. Naruto gave them a sad smile before he dropped the bomb. I retired as a Kanoha shinobi and am leaving the village for good. Tuchi and Ayam were shocked at his statement. Why did you do that, Naruto? Questioned Tuchi. I did it because I'm returning to my Ka-san's home village, Yuzu. I plan to rebuild it and have it flourish as a shinobi village once again. Ayam was surprised at that before she smiled sadly at him. You always were one to dream big, Naruto Kuin, but what about becoming Hokage? Did you give up on that? He nodded before replying, The village doesn't need me. They haven't for over two years now. Besides, rebuilding my home is more important to me right now. Tuchi frowned slightly. You never saw this place as home, did you, son? Naruto sighed at the question. Not completely, old man. I know that you and all of the people I've come to love will always be seen as family in my eyes. But this place just never felt like home. I can't explain it other than feeling a sense of longing whenever I bring up Yuzu into a conversation. It's like I feel homesick or something. Tuchi nodded while I am smiled. I completely understand, Naruto. You're feeling your ancestral home calling for you. The last of the Uzumaki. Your mother always mentioned being homesick as well, but she grew to see Kanoha as home eventually. I guess it's merely the opposite with you, huh? Asked the ramen chef. Naruto chuckled at that. Yeah, I guess it is. Well, that was all I wanted to say, so this is goodbye. Ayam quickly gave him another hug while Tuchi placed a comforting hand on the blonde's shoulder. I promise that I won't forget you guys. You were the first people I ever saw as family after all. Naruto then separated from them, said one final goodbye, and left the stand. Ayam shed a couple of tears but quickly wiped them away as Tuchi thought. There goes a man destined for incredible things. Naruto had reached his apartment a couple of minutes after leaving the stand and packed away the essentials inside a small ceiling scroll. He then lifted up a small carpet that held a seal on the floorboard before he deactivated the seal. The seal then released the bindings on the floorboard, and Naruto pulled out a single scroll that was from his late mother, Kushina. The scroll merely gave the location of Yuzu and a brief insight into what the Uzumaki specialized in. The Uzumaki clan was famous for one thing, Fuinjutsu, and they were greatly feared and respected for it. Unfortunately, it was the fear of what the clan could have become that set off its destruction from Kumo and IWA in the past. However, Naruto held no grudges since he did not live in the time of the clan. After putting the scrolls into his pocket, he took one last look at his home and reminisced about the nights he spent alone as a child. He shook his head out of those depressing thoughts as he began heading for the main gates to leave. Suddenly, he tensed and caught a kanai heading for his cheek. He then felt a familiar weight on his back and gave a small grin. Nice of you to see me off, Fanko, said Kunoichi, smirked as she got off of him before giving a playful pout. What's the deal with you not telling me you were leaving, Foxy? I only told Bachan and the Ichiraka family goodbye. I was actually hoping to avoid saying it to anyone else altogether. Anko's fake pout turned real at that. Not even me? I thought we were close, Gaki. We are, but saying goodbye to those three was hard enough as it was. Saying it to anyone else would have been too much. He then gave her a small smile and added, if it's any consolation, you would have been one of the first I'd have said it to. Anko returned the smile and said, yeah, I can live with that. Are you sure about this though? I thought you had big dreams here. Naruto shook his head at her questions. Not anymore. My future plans revolve around Yuzu and restoring it. He then embraced her one last time and teased, try not to drive the people too crazy when I'm gone. Anko smiled at that as she returned the embrace. No promises, Naruto. After releasing him, she gave him one last smirk and warned, Don't lose your edge, Foxy. You never know when I'll see you again. And when I do, I expect you to still be in top form. Naruto chuckled at her antics. I'll do my best, Anko. Goodbye, he said before he walked through the gates and left the village. Anko's smirk turned into a sad smile as she silently wished her friend good luck before she left for home. Nami no Kuni, Land of Waves, two weeks later. It took Naruto only a couple of days to reach Nami, and he happily got reacquainted with the people there. They were all excited to see their hero return and were more than happy to welcome him. He spent the remainder of the week trying to have someone take him as close to Yuzu as they could on a boat. He was in luck and found one by the end of the week, but he decided to stay for one more just to relax. He was retired, after all, so he could take his time getting home. The week of R&R was mainly spent in the company of Tazuna's family. 
His daughter Tsunami welcomed Naruto like a son who hadn't been home in years while Inari was glad to have his and Ai Sen back in Nami. Naruto told them stories of the war and the years that followed, and the three were surprised that the Shinobi Alliance had turned on each other so quickly. They also agreed that Naruto needed a break from constantly being the mediator of the disputes between villages. It saddened them that he talked about his experiences like a veteran past his prime instead of a young man. Naruto thoroughly enjoyed his time in Nami, but he knew that he had to get a move on. After saying his goodbyes to the people of Nami, he left for Yuzu on the boat he rented. The boat ride ended up taking a couple of days before they stopped a few miles away from the coast. According to the boat driver, the boat couldn't go any further due to the whirlpool surrounding the island. Naruto thanked the man and paid him before he stepped onto the water and began walking to the shore. Due to his Uzumaki blood, the whirlpools calmed when he neared them and resumed their torrents when he passed them. Once Naruto stepped onto the shore, he gazed upon the ruins of his home and smiled sadly. I'm home, Kasan. And now, I've got a lot of work to do. Naruto started off by searching through the ruins for anything worth scavenging. His Kage Bunshin, Shadow Clones, technique was immensely helpful in searching the ruins. In the span of two hours, the entire village, except the Yuzukage office, had been searched, and Naruto was lucky enough to find two scrolls, a medallion, and a trapdoor in one of the collapsed buildings. The scrolls were on right on, lightning element, techniques, and fuinjutsu. Naruto was glad that he had discovered during the years after the war that he had a secondary affinity for lightning, giving him affinities for futon, wind element, and right on jutsu. The scroll seemed like it was Kami's way of welcoming him home. The techniques were B to A rank jutsu, but there were only three total jutsu that were readable in the scroll, two B ranks and one A rank. He would work on them later. The Fuinjutsu scroll was actually a scroll for adept to master Fuinjutsu users, which suited Naruto just fine. He had taken up the intricate art of Fuinjutsu during his time away from the village and was a natural with them. He assumed it was his Uzumaki blood and left it at that. The teachings in the scroll were damaged slightly from the village's destruction, but it was still perfectly usable. The medallion was silver with a ruby gem in the center. Naruto and Kurama both noticed that there were seal arrays on the medallion that protected it from damage as well as stored chakra into the gem. Naruto smirked at the thought of restoring his chakra quickly with the seal. He wondered if he could store some of Kurama's yuki in it as well, but he would test it later. As for the trapdoor, it led to an underground bunker for the Uzumaki. Naruto was surprised by the discovery and wondered if there were other Uzumaki survivors besides his mother and Nagato. He searched the bunkers, only to find blood smears along the walls and decaying skeletons on the ground. Naruto shed a tear for the deaths of his ancestors and silently vowed to restore their honor. During his searching, he came across a small chi fuian, blood seal, along the wall and offered the blood required for it. The seal glowed before the wall in front of him separated and revealed a hidden office to the blonde. Naruto stepped inside to see that the office had remained untouched. There were scrolls on a shelf and what looked to be plans for a seal that was labeled Jaikasetsu Fuyin, Paradox Seal. Apparently, the seal was meant to place someone in a state of suspended animation until someone that met the seal's requirements removed it. While under the effects of the seal, one was supposed to age at a far slower rate, and the seal would also keep the body's health in the condition it started off with when using the seal. Naruto was impressed with the plans and sealed them away in a separate scroll so that he could attempt to finish it. He then searched the other scrolls and saw that they were more lessons on Fuinjutsu, but these were for Master Sealers. Master Sealers were practitioners of Fuinjutsu that had enough experience to use seals for practically anything. Based on the scrolls, Naruto deduced that the idea of the Jaikasetsu Fuyin was thought up by at least a few Master Sealers. After emptying the office, Naruto searched the rest of the bunker but found nothing else. As he left, he placed multiple Bakudan Fuyin, bomb seals, to destroy the bunker and the skeletons within. Naruto wished the souls a peaceful rest as he activated the seals and destroyed the bunker. The last building Naruto had to check was the Yuzukid's office. He had his clones avoid that building mainly because he wanted to search it himself. Once he stepped inside the office, he saw that it was mainly ashes and dust. He silently cursed IWA and Kumo before he began looking through the ashes. He didn't find anything solid in the office, but he did find another Chi Fuyin on the floor. When he released the seal, he pulled out a small scroll and saw that it was a final letter written by the last Yuzukage. The letter read, To the Uzumaki who finds this, I regret to say that I have failed in defending our home. Yuzushiogakure was a thriving village full of life and peace. We meant no harm to any of the other shinobi nations and tried to reason with them, but they were too stubborn and paranoid to see reason. 
Yuzu is most likely destroyed by now, but I'm sure you can rebuild. There will always be the village of Yuzu if there is but a single Uzumaki alive. Remember this, for I assume you are all we have left of our once great clan. Farewell, Erisher Uzumaki, the Nidame Yuzukich. Naruto reread the letter twice before he sighed and turned his gaze to the ruined village. There will always be the village of you. I suppose it's time to prove the statement is true. And with that, Naruto summoned his Kage Bunshin and began the long process of rebuilding his home. Two years later, as he thought, the rebuilding of Yuzu took quite a while. It took at least half a year to remove the rubble and dispose of it into the many whirlpools surrounding the island while it took the remaining year and a half to rebuild. Naruto wasn't alone though and enlisted the help of Tazuna and the people of Nami who wished to migrate to the rebuilding nation. Naruto accepted their request to stay with open arms, and the people worked tirelessly to restore the once beautiful village. By the end of two years, Yuzu had been reborn as a beautiful nation, while the land of Nami was used as an outpost for trades and goods. Naruto was appointed as Yuzukij, even though he felt he wasn't worthy, while he set up a small council that he called Shiro Rinj, White Lotus. It was named so because it was the rarest flower of Yuzu, and its beauty was unmatched. Naruto had also enlisted the old members of Jiraiya's spy network as honorary members of the Shiro Rinj and had them give him updates on the other villages. The last thing he did in preparation for the village was set up an alliance with the one man he saw as a brother, Sabaku Nogara. Sonagakir was more than happy to agree to the alliance with Yuzu, and Naruto was pleased with their acceptance. The Kages had met in Nami to solidify the alliance as well as allow Naruto and Gara to catch up. Gara was impressed with his brother's current success and determinately stated that their alliance would hold strong. After they went their separate ways, Naruto contacted some old acquaintances of his to set up more alliances and promote good relations. The nations chosen were Aim, Yuki, Oni, Hoshi, and the Nadashiko village, and they all accepted the alliance with Naruto. It slightly surprised the blonde when he received word that the priestess of Oni, Shion, had met another to help her keep the priestess line alive, but he was happy that she still accepted the alliance. In exchange for some advanced seals made by Naruto, they offered supplies, technology from Yuki, and some shinobi from the villages to increase Yuzu's own shinobi force. After all, one lone shinobi is definitely not enough to be counted as a shinobi village, even if the single shinobi is Naruto. It seemed as though things were looking up for the future. However, Naruto would soon see that the future would turn drastic. Eighteen years later, Yuzu, Naruto was currently holding off a battalion of soldiers from an alliance between IWA and Kumo. It stunned him how history had seemed to replay itself since the two villages feared Yuzu's rapid growth in force and alliances. He was also caught completely off guard by the invasion force. Apparently, the Shiro Rinj members that were stationed in IWA and Kumo were discovered and killed. Naruto cursed as he activated a defensive seal that released multiple katan, fire element, jutsu against the forces and activated his QB Sinin mode. Using his speed, he began decimating the forces left and right while the katan seals distracted them. He was determined to defend his home and was able to hold them all off easily while his shinobi rallied behind him and prepared to defend their home and their leader. Suddenly, a giant arrow made of dark chakra was fired towards the group, and Naruto defended them with a well-timed Bijou Rasengan, Tail Beast, Spiral Sphere. When the dust created from the clash cleared, Naruto was shocked to see Sasuke, Team Taka with the exception of Karen, and Orochimaru standing in front of the dual forces. Naruto glared at the Uchiha in rage and yelled, Sasuke, what are you doing to Yuzu? Sasuke smirked at Naruto and responded, What does it look like, dope? I'm taking away everything you hold dear just like your old village did to me. I left Kanoha. Team, I'm no longer a part of it. That may be, but you used to be. It doesn't matter though, seeing as how we've already destroyed it. Naruto froze at the Uchiha's statement. What do you mean? Why would you destroy the leaf, Sasuke? Because they deserved it, that's why. Kanoha is filled with nothing but worthless fools who feared the Uchiha and their potential. He then chuckled darkly before he confirmed, I guess their fear was justified since I wiped out that pathetic excuse of a village. Naruto shook with rage at that statement. He couldn't believe what he was hearing, and yet he also could believe it. He knew Sasuke wasn't lying, but he didn't want to believe it. His resolve set, Naruto activated one last seal that the enemy was closest to. I suppose the promise I made to Sakura no longer matters anymore. Goodbye Sasuke. Fuinjutsu. Bungshi Fuian. Sealing Art. Certain Death Seal. 
The ground beneath the enemy forces glowed in the design of a massive rune circle colored blood red while Naruto activated another seal. Get behind me, he ordered his people before he cried out, Fuin Jutsu, Jinsei Tate Fuin, Sealing Art, Life Shield Seal. Just like the seal under the enemy, rune circle appeared under the people of Yuzu. However, this circle was colored a golden yellow color. The circles expanded and trapped both forces in their respective zones with no means of escape. They inched closer and closer to one another while the people under the Bungshi Fuian tried desperately to break out using any jutsu or technique they knew. Sasuke's Sasanoa wasn't even enough to break through it, much to the Uchiha's surprise and rage. As soon as the rune circles were about to touch, Naruto said to Sasuke, I hope you enjoy your stay in hell, team. After his final statement, the circles finally touched and caused an explosion of incredible proportion that obliterated everyone and everything not within the Jinsei Tate Fuian. The smoke from the explosion rose up and gained what appeared to be a mushroom shape in the air, while the shockwave from the technique blew back everything. The protective seal held strong, though, and after about 15 minutes of waiting, it finally dispelled itself and revealed the aftermath of the explosion. Yuzu was once again destroyed, but there were no ruins at all this time. It was all gone, and Naruto grew sorrowful at what his creations had done. With a heavy heart, he turned to the people who had faithfully followed him and whispered, I'm sorry, before he disappeared in a flash of yellow. The people of the once rebuilt Yuzu would never see their Sandame Musikij again. Seventy years later, Kanoha ruins, a now 116-year-old Naruto, though he only appeared to be 26, stared out towards the ruins of Kanoha like he had done during his self-appointed exile from Yuzu. He knew that the world did not need Jinchuriki any longer since they brought nothing but chaos and destruction to the world, and he believed that he was to blame for the world's downfall. He hadn't changed much during his exile. He mainly looked much more mature and battle-hardened due to defending the home of his deceased friends and other precious people. Upon returning to the destroyed village of Kanoha, he spent a great deal of time making makeshift graves for each person he could positively remember from his time in the village, the main ones being the Kanoha shinobi he grew up with, Tsunade, Shizun, the Ichiraka chefs, and Enko. His attire had changed once again during his time in the village remains. He kept his sunin coat, wore a long-sleeved black shirt with an armored shoulder plate on his left side, blood-red cargo pants with Kanoha's symbol stitched to the sides in gold lettering, black a and BU boots, and the headband of Yuzu wrapped around his left bicep. The most notable change was the blonde's hair. He never once cut it, and it grew into a style very much like that of the Uchiha patriarch, Madara. When asked why by his tenant, Naruto responded, So I'll never forget the man who started it all. He turned to Bito who, in turn, made Sasuke who he was before his death. Kyuubi respected that answer but was still slightly unnerved by the new look. Over the years, he had increased his skills in Futon, Right Un, and Fuin Jutsu to unmatched levels, and also learned Medical Jutsu to the point of being able to heal moderate wounds such as a broken bone. The Uzumaki also trained Kyuubi and Gamasanin modes to the point of gaining a high form of empathy. It enabled him to feel the energies of millions and stretch his senses for miles upon miles. He felt their anger their despair, their anguish, and their destruction all throughout his exile, yet he stayed away. He would not interfere with the world and its problems anymore due to a new sense of apathy for the world and its constant destruction. How could he ever hope to care for a world that would not even save itself from its own destruction? No, his time as peacekeeper ended decades ago. Still though, living in a time where it was nothing but war and violence didn't seem too appealing to the seemingly immortal Jinchuriki. So he had been preparing for his nap, as Kurama endearingly labeled. The nap would be initiated by the now completed Jai Kasetsu Fuien being activated on Naruto. Since his aging was already slowed due to the QB, Naruto and the fox believed that the seal would slow it even further to the point of halting it altogether. This did not stop the fox from worrying about its container. Kit, are you sure about this? The QB asked Naruto as the blonde readied the seal. The two were now currently under the ruined village in a cavern like chamber that Naruto had filled with various seals. Having 100 years to study Fuinjutsu had made him a master unlike any other, and it was his seals that brought the world's destruction. Yes, Kurama, I am sure. I've had 70 years to think this over, and my mind's made up. This time does not need us, so we will wait and sleep until a time where we are needed arises, Naruto mentally answered his tenant. The QB sighed at its container's decision. It knew that Naruto had given up on this time, but the fox did not think that the blonde would actually seal himself away. Before you activate the seal, 
What are you going to have as the requirements to remove it? Naruto was silent as he thought it over. After what had seemed like hours, he finally made his decision. The requirements to remove this seal will be that the remover must be strong-willed, they must have a pure soul, and they must have the blood of this time flowing through them. Only with those requirements will one be able to remove the seal. He then activated the seal surrounding the cavern with the Kyuubi's Yuki, an action that confused the fox. Naruto decided to elaborate. Those seals will allow you to see those who enter this place. You will be the one who judges them, Kurama, since you are the better of the both of us at sensing the worth in people. Once they have your approval, the seal will be able to be removed. How will I know when someone has entered? Their blood must touch any part of the cavern. If their blood has the essence of this time flowing through it, then the seals will activate. Once it does, you will be able to see if they are worthy. I'm counting on you for this, Kurama. The fox's gaze softened at its container. It was ironic that the being that caused Naruto so many problems in his life was the one being that he fully trusted. You can count on me, Naruto. Naruto smiled at the fox when he said his name. The Kyuubi only called him by name when he sympathized with Naruto and truly felt for him. He mentally held out his fist, which the fox bumped its own against, before stating, I know I can. I'll see you when I wake up. Naruto then cut the mental connection before putting in the requirements for removal on the tag holding the Jaikasetsu Fuian. After he finished, he placed the seal on his chest and whispered, Fuian, seal. Once the seal had activated, the rune slowly spread around Naruto's body, save for his head, and covered it in a white substance that wrapped around him in a cocoon of sorts and attached itself to the wall behind him. Unknown to him, the spirits of the world began their own plan to save the world by creating a bridge between their world and the mortal world. The being would be the replacement peacekeeper of the Child of Prophecy and would be known as the Avatar. And years later, the era of Benders had begun along with many changes to the once shinobi-filled world. 4,997 years later, three years before ADLA canon, people never forgot about the Age of Shinobi, which was now known as the Age of Chaos, or of the fabled Hero of the Flame. Naruto's story was held in high regard by all nations, and there were many who believed that he was still out there, no matter how impossible the idea seemed. Over the years after Naruto's sealing, people with the natural ability to use the elements of air, water, earth, and fire came into fruition. These people were called benders, due to making the elements bend to their will. Unfortunately, these new abilities brought new ways to separate and destroy the world. The people of the air, the air nomads, were once a peaceful race. They lived in large temples and traveled the world on their flying bison. They were the most spiritual of all the cultures and lived in harmony with nature. They also were fun-loving people and had a strong sense of humor. The airbenders utilized their talent over the air by drawing it out in circular motions as well as using it to evade their opponents. This reluctance for offensive techniques was due to their passive nature. Unfortunately, the peaceful people were victims of genocide at the start of Sozin's Hundred Year War while the current avatar had disappeared without a trace. The people of the water were a respectable people and were known as the water tribes. They strived to live in harmony with nature and with the other nations of the world while using their bending for protection and healing purposes. There were two primary groups of water tribes, the northern and the southern, with some smaller tribes spread out around the world. However, it was hard for the main tribes to keep contact with one another due to being on polar opposites of the world. The northern tribe inhabited the North Pole while the southern tribe inhabited the South Pole. Their already difficult contact practically ended with the start of the war by Fire Lord Sozin. The people of the Earth were vast in number, which allowed them to form the Earth Kingdoms. Proud and strong, the Earth Kingdom citizens adhered to a philosophy of peaceful coexistence and cooperation with the other nations of the world and used their bending as a mix of stable defense and rough offense. They were also an ethnically diverse country, with wide variance in customs between different provinces and tribes. Out of all the nations attacked during Sozin's Hundred Year War, the Earth Kingdom suffered no serious casualties and still currently thrived as a nation. The people of Fire, the Fire Nations, were the second largest nation of the world in terms of population and area, second to the Earth Kingdom. They were passionate and had strong wills, which was the first source of their bending. However, most found that using their rage and anger was an easier alternative to using firebending, and many have forgotten the old teachings. The Fire Nation's economy is the most powerful in the world, with a strong industrial sector and extensive technological developments. It was also known for its large, powerful military. It was Fire Lord Sozin who started the Hundred Year War by using a comet that increased firebending exponentially. With the genocide of the Air Nomads, 
the separation of the water tribes, and the slight fear instilled into the Earth Kingdom, Sozin's war was off to a good start for the current Fire Lord, Ozai. It is also in the Fire Nation where the start of the end of the war begins, Ember Island. On the island resort, we find the children of Fire Lord Ozai and their two friends currently on the shore of the island. The children were Prince Zuko and Princess Azula, and their friends were Tai Li and Mai. The children were sent to the island while their parental figures were busy with their governmental schedules and issues. While Tai Li was overly excited, the others were not as excited or not excited at all. Zuko was currently playing Kwai Ball with some other people while the girls were talking amongst one another. This place is so great. I can't wait to just relax and do nothing all day, gushed a happy Tai Li. Calm down, Tai Li. It's not worth that much excitement. Besides, I'd much rather be back at home and participate in father's war meetings, Azula stated with a small huff. She may have been the younger of the two between Zuko and herself, but she was a prodigy at firebending and it showed with her fire slowly becoming hotter and changing color. She was fascinated with her father's war meetings and desperately wished to take part in one in the future. My side in boredom over the group's vacation. I just want this trip to be over with. I don't understand how you guys can like this troublesome place so much, especially you. Ty Lee. Ty Lee pouted cutely at her friend. Oh come on, Mai. You can't seriously be telling me that you aren't the least bit excited? Mai gave her a blank look and replied, I can and I will. She then turned her gaze to the happy, people having fun on the beach and expressing themselves. Her bored look turned to one of small envy at their expressiveness, as she was unable to fully express herself due to her father's reputation as a governor. True. If she behaved she got whatever she wanted, but money and gifts only bought happiness to a certain point before it didn't matter anymore. She sighed again before standing up and stating, I'm gonna take a walk. I'll be back. Her two friends watched her leave, one not caring and one slightly concerned. However, the two decided to drop it and just enjoy the beach. Mai was walking along the shore and getting steadily further away from the beach crowd. She didn't have a set destination in mind. She just wanted to walk and clear her head. She walked along the rock face of the island's cliffside and just kept to her thoughts about home. She loved her parents, but they were so controlling over her life and demanded her to act like a doll. Unable to change expression from what she was manufactured to be, she was brought out of her thoughts by a small gust of wind passing by her and entering a cavern next to her. She stared into the dark cave and felt a small sense of foreboding from it. It was strange to her, yet the foreboding also came with the sense of the cave calling out to her. Curiosity getting the better of her, she began to walk into the cavern. It was hard to see, so she kept her hand along the inner walls of the cave to help guide her. Unfortunately, some parts of the wall had sharper rocks and one of them cut into her palm, resulting in a few drops hitting the ground. As soon as the blood touched the cavern floor, a being once thought lost to the world woke up and used its power to activate the seals inside of the cave. Mai was surprised to see the walls covered in red runes that allowed her to see the inside. She noticed that she had slowly entered a circular opening within the cave, and she gazed at a white object stuck to the wall on the other side of the opening. Inside of the object's seal, a certain fox observed the young teen through the seals surrounding the cavern walls. Using its ability of empathy, the fox saw that this girl craved to express herself but was also innocent and that her soul was pure. The fox then focused on the blood that hit the ground and was shocked to see how thickly the essence of the old world flowed through the drops. Interesting. This girl meets the requirements and has the most essence of the old world that I have ever encountered over the years. Perhaps she truly is the one to remove the seal. The fox then pushed its energy through the cavern seals and spoke to the confused teen. Welcome, child. Tell me, do you know what this place holds? Mai was shocked to hear a voice speak throughout the cave and searched for the source. She then heard the same voice give a small chuckle and grew irritated. What exactly is so funny? The fact that you are trying to locate me when my location is far beyond your understanding, is amusing. Step closer to the object stuck to the wall, child, and see exactly where I am. While skeptical, my slowly approached the object to see that it was a person wrapped in a white cocoon of sorts with a piece of paper where she assumed the person's chest would be. The paper had a strange design and was pulsing with a red glow every few seconds. Since the person's head was bent down, she bent over to get a better look at their face. She discovered that it was a man with naturally tanned skin, whisker-like markings on his cheeks, hair as gold as the sun, and a calm expression on his sleeping face. Meet my container, child. This is the man once praised as the hero of the flame, Naruto Uzumaki. Her eyes widened in recognition at the name. It was taught in ancient history at her school that the hero of the flame 
was a man who helped end a major war and was once the peacekeeper of the world. However, the constant disputes between the nations at the time forced the hero to stop his foolish duty and leave the world. It was unknown where he went or what had happened to him, but now she had supposedly found him. Is there proof that he is who you claim? Instead of hearing the voice answer her, she noticed another rune appear where she assumed the man's navel would be. From the glowing rune, a spectral head of a red fox appeared and gazed into the girl's amber eyes with its blood-red ones. The proof you ask for is me, the Kyubi no Kitsune. I have resided inside of this man ever since his birth over 5,000 years ago. The tag you see on his chest is actually what is known as a seal from our time that he perfected. The seal has placed him in the state you see him in now and can only be removed by one who meets the requirements. And that person is you. Me? What have I done to prove I could remove that seal? She asked in surprise. Naruto set up three requirements to removing the seal. The remover must have a strong will, they must have a pure soul, and they must have the essence of his time flowing through their blood. You meet those requirements because you were courageous enough to enter this place. Your soul is pure from the world's taint, and you have the highest levels of the old world's essence in your blood that I've ever witnessed. You are the one who could finally remove the seal and awaken a man who has been hidden away from the world for about 5,000 years. Mai was shocked at the influence she had on the future of the world. If she released the hero, would he put the world first and go against the Fire Nation? Or would years of seeing the world constantly destroy itself make him not care about the outcome? She was slightly afraid, yet also curious at the same time. In the end, curiosity won over fear, and she slowly reached for the seal and grasped the top right corner of it. As soon as she came into contact with it, she felt a small jolt of electricity course through her and a gust of wind rush past her. The seal has deemed you worthy. Now please, remove it so that my container and I may finally see the world once again. Mai was surprised to hear the spectral fox actually plead to her, but she nodded before taking a deep breath and removing the seal. As soon as she did, the cavern was engulfed in a bright light that forced her to close her eyes. She kept them closed until she felt it was safe to see what happened. After the blinding light died down, Mai took in her surroundings and she was confused as to where she ended up. While still on an island, she noticed that she was no longer on Ember Island. The land was lush with grass and flora and the ocean shore had sand as white as snow. Waves gently rolled along the shore before slowly returning to the waters they called home. She then heard many different voices and turned her sights to a village full of happy people going about their everyday lives. Slowly walking through the streets, she took notice that some people stopped and waved to her before continuing their day. She nervously returned their gestures while continuing her trek through the village. There were many shops, some restaurants, and many children running around with joyful expressions. It was as if this place was full of peace and serenity. Mai couldn't stop the small smile that came to her face at the sight of all the happiness around her. It's beautiful, isn't it? Came a familiar voice from seemingly everywhere. Mai froze at the voice of the QB and saw that the scene she was in slowly faded away and the once joyful village turned into an island filled with ruins of the once peaceful civilization. Now look at it. This once peaceful village has become nothing more than a painful memory for my container. The place you find yourself in, child, is the once great nation of Yuzu. What happened to it? What made it become this? She asked while gazing at the depressing island. The answer to your question, child, is war. War is what made this once beautiful place, the home of my ancestors, what it is now, came a new voice making my turn to it. What she saw was a blonde man with a red cloak with black flames on the bottom, a long-sleeved black shirt with an armored shoulder plate on his left side, blood-red cargo pants with a golden swirled leaf symbol stitched to the sides in gold lettering, black combat boots, and a headband with a swirl design wrapped around his left bicep. On his face were six whisker markings, and his long spiky hair was waist-length with shoulder-length bangs framing the sides of his face, with some bangs covering his right eye entirely. Who are you? She asked in slight fear since this man looked primed and ready for war. He gave her a blank stare before turning his gaze to behind her and said, I'm glad that you actually found someone to awaken me, Karama. Mai turned her gaze behind her and saw a giant fox resting on the shores of the island. The great being had orange fur a human-like upper torso complete with opposable forepaws and nine tails swaying behind it. The fox smirked at the two humans and replied, Well, you asked me to find someone and personally I was getting fed up of waiting after nearly 5,000 years, Naruto. The newly named man smirked back and retorted, I should have figured you'd grow bored of waiting, fox. Still though, 5,000 years is quite a long sleep. 
No crap, the fox commented with sarcasm. Wait a minute, cried Mai, gaining the attention of the other two. So you, she pointed at QB, are telling me that he, she then pointed to Naruto, is the guy that was trapped in that white thing I saw? He is the hero of the flame? That would be correct, Ninjin. Ninjin? She asked in confusion. In our time, it is roughly translated to human, explained Naruto. The fox you see is in fact a spirit purely made of energy that was sealed into me during my birth. Yeah, I know. The fox told me before I took off that strange paper. That paper was a seal that kept me rooted to that spot until someone worthy was able to remove it. Although, I am surprised that one as young as you was actually able to remove it. I saw him gain a thoughtful look and heard him mutter something that sounded like, hidden potential. What hidden potential are you talking about? She asked, causing him to look at her with a calculative gaze, like he was studying her. It made her uncomfortable, and she was about to tell him to quit it before he beat her to it. Yes, I do believe we have a winner here, Karama. Of course we do. I'm the one who told her to remove the seal after all, the fox replied with a snort. Hmm, what's your name, girl? Naruto asked Mai. She hesitated for a second before she answered, It's Mai. No surname, just Mai? Well, we never really use our surname. My father tells me not to since it reminds people of the Age of Chaos. The Age of Chaos? What era was the Age of Chaos? Your time, she answered with a barely audible voice. Naruto had a blank stare before he sighed and leaned on a piece of rubble. I suppose that makes sense. My time was full of nothing but chaos after all. You could say that again? Well, tell me the surname anyway, Naruto urged. I don't see the point to why you think my surname is so important. You're really troublesome, you know that. She retorted with her arms crossed defiantly, making Naruto and QB smirk at her wording. Nara slash Nara, they said simultaneously, making her eyes widen. Wait, how did you know that? Simple really. The Nara clan was infamous for their use of the word troublesome. That and your eyes have a calculative glance, studying my every move, word, and expression. So why ask when you already knew? She asked in slight irritation. I didn't know completely, so I wanted you to confirm it for me. Anyway, we should probably get out of here. This place is depressing, Naruto said with pitying eyes as he gazed at the ruins. He placed a hand on her shoulder and said, Brace yourself, Mai. I'll talk to you soon, Karama. I'll be waiting. Ember Island. Mai opened her eyes to the reddish glow of the hidden cavern where she found the sealed blonde and noticed that said man was stretching his stiff limbs. Geez, nearly 5,000 years of staying still really does a number on your body, he said as he popped multiple joints, making my cringe slightly. So, where are we anyway? We're in a cave on Ember Island of the Fire Nation. It's supposed to be some super island resort, she said before rolling her eyes. Personally, I find this place more troublesome than home. At least at home I have stuff to do. Naruto raised a brow and asked, not one for vacations, huh? TSK, this isn't a vacation. This is just our parents getting us out of their hair while they get important business done. Ah, that reminds me of the times when Dash, he began before stopping abruptly. When what? Mai asked before she noticed him shake his head as if trying to forget something. Never mind. It's nothing, he said before making his way out of the cave with my right behind him. As soon as they made it out, Naruto took in a large breath of the sea air with a content smile on his face. I forgot how much I missed the smell of the sea. It reminds me of home. Mai said nothing and just began walking back to the main beach. She heard Naruto's footsteps behind her and asked, Why are you following me? Naruto gave her a deadpan look and replied, You really expect me to go out into the world with little to no knowledge of how it works, who's in charge, or what's happening? You unsealed me, so I need you to help me. You want me to help you? Why should I help a troublesome person like you? I could tell you about your ancestors and how they were good people. I sense a lingering power within you, my, and I could help you draw it out. What makes you think I want to let out this hidden power anyway? I know it interests you. Just like I know how you feel like you have to be a perfect daughter for your parents due to your father's standing. I also know that you envy people who actually have the freedom to express themselves while you don't have that privilege in your eyes. My gasped in shock at his words and the truth behind them. How do you know so much about me? Years before I sealed myself away, I gained empathic abilities, the ability to sense the emotions in people. When I mentioned your ancestors, I felt intrigue coming from you. When I mentioned your status as a perfect child, I felt some sadness and a little self-loathing. And when I mentioned your envy for others, I felt it pour from you in waves. 
Mai averted her gaze from his piercing blue eye. She couldn't deny that what he said was true, and it irritated her how easily he saw right through her board facade. Even her parents couldn't see it. Not that they really paid much attention to her in the first place. I'm sure your parents love you, Mai. They probably just can't express it as much as they wish due to their duties to your home, Naruto said reassuringly as he sensed her emotions again. Stop reading my emotions, she yelled while glaring coldly at him. Just shut up and stop acting like you know me when you don't. She then felt a few stray tears leave her eyes before she whispered, You don't know me. Naruto sighed at her outburst. But he knew that she had shown who she really was in that moment. She had done exactly what he did years ago. Bottle up everything. He knew the consequences of doing so. Yet he also knew how to help someone who had their emotions bottled up. He moved slowly so as not to startle her and pulled her into a reassuring embrace. She gasped in shock and moved to get out when he whispered, It's all right, Mai. Let it out. No one is here but you and me. She still struggled before the emotional dam finally began to break. Slowly her struggling turned to shaking sobs before she clutched the blonde holding her and released her held back tears. She let out everything while Naruto whispered reassuring words to her and held her close. It reminded him of when Anko did the same for him when he was a child, begging to know the reason why the villagers scorned him. Anko had been there for him and comforted him, earning herself a place among his precious people. After some time, Mai finally calmed down enough to let go of Naruto. Uh, thanks for that, she said nervously. He gave a small smile and replied, don't worry about it. I was out of line by blatantly reading your emotions. I apologize. He noticed her nod silently and waited for her to speak. She was quiet for some time before finally saying, so, you'll tell me about the Nara if I tell you about the world today. That's what you're saying, right? Naruto smirked and replied, I'll do you one better. What do you mean by better? Keeping his smirk, Naruto said, Should you uphold your end of the deal and tell me everything I need to know about the world in this time? I'll teach you, not just about your clan, but I'll teach you how to utilize your hidden potential. And how would I be using that? If you choose to accept, I'll teach you how to use chakra in the ways of the shinobi, the warriors of the shadows that lived in my time. Mai's eyes widened in shock at the offer the man presented to her. During the lessons on ancient history at the Fire Nation Academy, they learned of the seemingly godlike feats that shinobi were capable of in the past. The ability to use the elements in ways benders could only dream of, the ability to summon creatures of various shapes and sizes, the power to take down hundreds of foes with ease, and so much more. It was quite an offer, but there had to be a catch. All right, what more do you want besides information on the world? Teaching me the ways of the shinobi and about my clan seems a little too good to be true for some simple information you can find in a library. Naruto chuckled at her analytical mind. She really was a Nara, through and through. How astute of you, Mai. Yes, there is something else I would like. And that would be? If I am to teach you the shinobi arts, then you won't just be my student. You'll be my apprentice whom I will pass on some of my skills onto. I will need you to support me should the people of your nation see me as a threat or an enemy and I will also expect you to not hide your true self during our lessons. No masking or holding back your emotions. If you're angry, upset, or unsure of something, then I will expect you to not keep it to yourself and let me know so that I could try to help you. Do you understand? He asked with a serious expression. Mai didn't answer immediately and turned her gaze to the horizon. She thought over his offer silently while Naruto mentally praised the girl for not rushing into something she knew nothing of. After what felt like ten minutes, she turned her gaze back to him and asked, Could I have time to think about it? I'll still tell you what you want to know and vouch for you, but I'm not sure about the whole, learning the shinobi arts yet. Naruto nodded while giving her a small smile. Of course, in fact, I'm glad you want some time to think about it. If you just rushed into it, I would have called you out on it. Mai nodded at that and began heading back to her friends. Thanks. Now, we better get back, or else Tai Lee will overdramatize her worry of where I went off to, she said with a sigh while Naruto chuckled at her expression. Sounds like this Tylee is a good friend. A little worrisome, but a good friend all the same, he commented while following her. With Azula and Ty Lee. Where is she? She usually isn't gone this long, commented a worried Ty Lee while Azula rolled her eyes. Will you relax? Mai can handle herself, and besides, there isn't anything dangerous on this island. Easy for you to say, Azula. I heard rumors that there's a cave on this island that releases an aura of power and fear that keeps people at bay. She then gasped and cried out, Oh no! What if Mai found the cave and was taken by some monster? Azula sighed at her over-imaginative friend and just stayed silent. 
That rumor Tai Li mentioned lingered in her mind, an aura of power and fear. If father knew of this, he would probably search for the source. Assuming this rumor has any merit, she was brought out of her thoughts when Tai Li cried out, I see her. She's coming over. She then gained a confused look and finished, and there's some guy with golden hair walking with her. Azula turned her gaze to where Tai Li was pointing and saw that she was right. Walking beside Mai was a tall man with strange clothing and an even stranger hair color that reached his waist and covered his right eye. She had never heard of anyone who had golden hair before, so she was intrigued. Plus, the way he carried himself was that of an experienced warrior that seemed to hold no equal. Just the sight of this mysterious man interested her, and seeing him walking and conversing with Mai deepened her interest. Once the two reached Azula and Tylee, Mai offered a lazy wave and greeted, Hey, sorry for taking so long. I got distracted by something, mind-blowing. Tylee smiled and merely hugged her friend. That's all right. I'm just glad you're okay. I was so worried. My sweat dropped before deadpanning. I didn't even leave the island. Naruto chuckled at the scene before he felt Azula's interested gaze and met her amber eyes with his azure one. The two had a stare down for not even five seconds before Azula backed off, unable to hold her gaze against the man. Spirits, I know he's holding back, but I still couldn't hold my own against him. And we just looked into each other's eyes. Who is this man? Hmm. There's something about this girl that feels familiar, but I can't put my finger on it. So my, who's your uh friend? Tylee asked. This is Naruto. I found him in a small cave down the shore. He needs to speak to Fire Lord Ozai and ask a few questions. And what does this man need to ask my father about? Azula asked with slightly narrowed eyes. Naruto narrowed his own at her, making her back off. Questions that do not concern you at the moment, child. At this time, Zuko arrived and was surprised to see the strange man talking to the girls. He shook it off and merely stated, Hey girls, Lo, and Lee said we're ready to return home. They nodded before they began heading to the docks with Naruto in tow. Azula couldn't stop sneaking curious glances at the whiskered blonde while Zuko decided to introduce himself. Nice to meet you. I'm Prince Zuko of the Fire Nation. Naruto gave a nod and replied, My name is Naruto Uzumaki, Zukoaji. What does Aji mean? asked the Fire Prince. In the current time, it roughly translates to Prince. I merely utilize the language of a dead time sometimes in my speech. That's so cool. Tai Li said in awe, How do you know an old language? Naruto chuckled and replied, Perhaps I'll tell you how I know later. For now, let's just get to the ship. The girl pouted at the lack of an answer, but nodded anyway. She then turned to Mai and asked, So, how do you know this guy? I mean, you said you met him in a cave, but you seem like you already know a bit about him. Mai looked slightly nervous, but Naruto saved her by answering, When we met, we talked for some time about our lives and what our goals were. Mai has quite the head on her shoulders. Such an analytical mind, and at such a young age, is nothing short of impressive. Mai mentally thanked the blonde for bailing her out and saw him give her a discreet wink. Yeah, and one of his goals can be accomplished if he speaks to the Fire Lord. So I offered him a ride with us. Azula scowled at Mai and asked, And do you honestly think that my father will allow this man to be granted an audience with him so easily? Naruto chuckled at the girl, causing her scowl to deepen. I think I'll be able to convince him to speak to me. In fact, I think he'll be pleased to meet me, Azulaheim. What did you call me? I merely addressed you by your title. Heim translates to princess in the modern tongue. Azula slowly nodded, and the group of five boarded the small ship heading for the mainland. Lo and Lee were ready to greet them before catching sight of Naruto, leaning on the side railing of the ship. Their eyes widened, and they walked towards him. My dear lad, began Lo, are you perhaps a man of legend? Finished Lee. Naruto raised a brow at their unique way of speaking and replied, that depends on the legend you speak of. We know who you are. Hero of the flame. Naruto smirked and retorted. If you knew, then why ask me? What does knowing who I am do for you? The two elderly women smiled at his question. Why young man, it means that you are a man who is long ahead of your time. The question remains though. How are you in this time that is not your own? Naruto gave them a serious look and answered. The means are not of your concern for the moment. I will explain everything to the high daimyo. Fire Lord, should I be granted an audience? And an audience you shall receive, stated Lo. The Fire Lord will have no problem speaking to a man of your caliber, added Lee. Naruto nodded in thanks before he moved to stand next to Mai. Those two, scare me, he commented with a slight shudder. Mai smirked and replied, Wow, 
and here I thought nothing could get to you. I may be a hero, and the last shinobi on this earth, but I'm not invincible. There are still some things that bother me and unnerve me, and those two are one of those things. Mai gave a small laugh at that. Well, don't worry so much about it. They could get to anyone without even trying. A few hours later, mainland? Once the group reached the port of the mainland, they disembarked and walked through the streets to the Fire Lord's palace. While Mai, Tai Li, and Naruto walked while Zuko and Azula rode in palanquins. Many people stared at Naruto in wonder, and he was slowly getting uncomfortable by it. He was about to snap before a small child walked up to him with an innocent smile on her face. She held up her hand and offered him a yellow flower that matched his sun-kissed hair. Taking the flower with a smile, Naruto decided to return the gesture and focus Chakra into a seal hidden on his left pinky. From the seal, a small figurine of a fox appeared, and he handed it to her. The child looked at him in awe before smiling brightly and taking the figurine with a polite thank you. Naruto had a melancholic smile as he watched the child run off to show her friends her gift. That figurine came from Inari's daughter, Tamaki while he was Yuzukich. It was meant as a gift for his tenth year as leader of Yuzu, and he happily accepted it. After the second destruction of Yuzu, he kept it safe in hopes of finding someone to pass it on to. That girl who gave him the flower reminded him so much of Tamaki that giving her the figurine felt right. Seeing her bright smile and her friend's amazed stares furthered the feeling. He then noticed that he was about to be left behind by the escorts, so he used Hinge to transform into a raven and fly after them, leaving the adults in shock and the children in amazement at the display. The raven Naruto landed on Mai's shoulder, slightly startling her, and said sarcastically, Thanks for waiting. Mai shook off her surprise at the transformed blonde and replied, Next time you should keep up? Well, Excuse me for being nice to that little girl. It's not my fault she offered me this flower. He defended while presenting the flower in his talon. I was merely returning the gesture. Mai shrugged, slightly shaking Naruto off balance and said, Whatever you say, bird boy. Once the group made it to the palace, Naruto transformed back into his true form and followed them inside. The palace itself was incredibly elegant and regal. So much so that Naruto felt out of place in it. The palace was comprised of enormous halls and retained an intricate array of wings and chambers. Large tapestries lined the walls with their beauty. Naruto also saw elaborate fire-themed images and moldings laid out all throughout the numerous sections of the structure. Once they reached the door to the throne room, Naruto was surprised that Lo and Lee were already waiting for them. Lord Ozai is expecting you all, they stated simultaneously before leading them to the throne room doors. Opening the doors, Lo and Lee allowed them to enter before closing the doors behind them. The throne room had many black pillars with elaborate gold bases that supported the roof and had black tiled floors, all designed to reflect the firelight. The fire lord sat on an ornate, covered throne on a higher platform that was surrounded by a wall of fire. Adorning the wall behind him was an enormous bar-relief image of a dragon breathing fire. The children all dropped to one knee with their heads bowed in respect while Naruto stayed, standing with his arms crossed. Azula scowled at the utter disrespect the blonde showed her father while the others were worried about the consequences of his actions. Ozai narrowed his own eyes at the blonde and saw his single blue eye staring straight into his own amber ones, as if he was seeing right through him. It unnerved, angered, and intrigued him all at once at how easily the man held himself in Ozai's presence. Tell me, boy, why do you not show me the respect I deserve in my own throne room? Asked Ozai in a calm voice that hid his irritation. Naruto merely leaned on one of the pillars while keeping his gaze on the man. In my eyes, respect is earned and I have not seen a reason to give it to you. You dare insult me in my own home? Questioned Ozai while the wall of flames grew in size. Naruto scoffed before waving his hand and using futon chakra to remove the oxygen from the flames, shocking the people in the room. Do not hold the notion that you can intimidate me, Ozai, son of Azulin. You know not what I'm capable of and how easily I can do away with you. Ozai and Azula scowled at him, while the rest looked at him in shock. You do not seem to know your place, boy. No. It is you who doesn't know your place, child. You're thousands of years too young to even be a challenge for me, Naruto retorted. I'm sure Lo and Lee informed you of my identity, as I'm also sure you know of the legends behind my name. I fail to see such a man in front of me. All I see is a disrespectful child attempting to intimidate me. Are you sure you aren't confusing me with yourself? asked Naruto from behind the Fire Lord. The others turned to see him leaning on the dragon-themed wall before turning to see the Naruto, leaning on the pillar fade from view. Such speed, 
He could have easily killed me without me noticing, thought Ozai as a bead of sweat fell from his brow. Naruto calmly walked back to the teens and stood in front of them. In case you need further proof, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, Jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Yoko, Child of Prophecy, Sinin of the Gama Clan, Sande Musikage of Yuzushiogakure, and the Hero of the Flame. The list of titles confused the others due to the lack of understanding of the old language. Ozai, however, having studied the history of the Fire Nation in depth, had some knowledge of the language and he was able to decipher what they meant. So, he's the human sacrifice of the Nine-Tailed Fox, Sage of the Toad Clan, and the Third World Shadow of the Whirling Tides Village. Not many people know of those titles for this man, but I'm still not entirely convinced. Ozai stared at the blonde in front of him and laced his fingers in front of him. You claim you are the revered hero, however. I would like to see you prove your claim. Oh, and how would you like me to prove myself to you? A simple test, really. Legends say of your many abilities and powers. I want to see you prove that these legends are true. Naruto crossed his arms in front of him and gave Ozai a blank stare. I assume you're looking for specific abilities during this test of yours? Indeed. You will need to show your affiliation with the Toads, your mastery of the elements you wield, and your legacy. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the word, legacy. I hope you realize that if I use that particular power, whoever you have watching these tests will either be dead, dying, or driven mad? I do. However, the proof is needed to stake your claim as being our revered hero. Naruto kept his blank stare while retorting. I could just end you in the blink of an eye and be done with it. However, doing so will do nothing more than cause the people to fear me and scorn me. Two things I've had plenty of to last many lifetimes. So, do we have a deal? Ozai asked with a smirk. Naruto gave a slow nod before turning to leave the throne room. Have someone escort me to the designated area when you are prepared, he stated on his way out. Ozai kept his smirk before turning to the teens and dismissing them. All but Azula left and Ozai asked, What do you make of him, Azula? The girl closed her eyes and thought while answering, He's definitely powerful and incredibly intimidating. I couldn't even meet his gaze for more than five seconds. What of the claims he makes? Do you believe he is who he says he is? I'm pretty sure he is, but we'll definitely have an answer after your test for him, father. Hmm. You may go now, he stated while leaving his throne room to prepare his test for the man, with Naruto. In the royal gardens, Naruto sat in a lotus position on top of the water of a nearby pond. His eyes were closed in concentration while his breathing was even and calm. He focused on his mindscape and reappeared in the populated streets of Yuzu. Seeing the smiling faces of the people he left behind made him clench his fists and shed a lone tear. You can't keep doing this to yourself, Kit, the QB said as the visage of the peaceful village was replaced with the user ruins. It isn't healthy to dwell on the past so much. I know, but I can't help but think back on those peaceful times. Back then, all seemed right with the world and I was happy. For the first time in so long, I was happy. Naruto turned his attention to the fox lying down behind him and saw it release a sigh. Kit, you know those times are over. It's been over 5,000 years since you've seen the people of Yuzu. Think about it though. Would the people who followed you, adored you, and stood by you want to see you dishonor their memory by dwelling on what once was? No, they wouldn't. They'd want me to press forward and live for them, just like Jiraiya-sensei. The blonde then sighed and gazed towards the rising sun in the horizon. Let the dawning sun act like the will of my people urging me to move on, he stated before fading away from the mindscape. Kyuubi turned its gaze to the dawning horizon and smirked. You would all be proud of your usage. He'll get through this, it stated as the ghostly silhouettes of the villagers appeared in the sunlight. With smiles of encouragement and hope, they faded away to the heavens above. Naruto opened his eyes to the sight of my reading a book while Tai Lee was staring at him. Zuko and Azula were nowhere to be seen probably doing trivial royalty errands. He then turned his gaze to Tai Li who had a curious glance on her face. Is there something you need? I was just wondering how you're sitting on top of the water. Are you using waterbending to have the water beneath you stay solid? Naruto raised a brow in confusion. What is waterbending? Tai Li looked shocked while my side and closed her book. Calm down, Tai Li. Naruto is from the past, remember? I thought he was kidding. She retorted incredulously before returning her gaze to him. Are you really from the past? Naruto closed his eyes and sighed while running a hand through his hair, letting the two girls see that his right eye had a scar going down it from his brow to his cheek. Yes, 
I was born during the Age of Chaos. I was able to seal myself away before my found me in that cavern on Ember Island and remove the seal. Tai Li's eyes widened before she began doing a sort of happy jig. Yes, I was right about there being a strange cave on the island. She cheered while Naruto and my sweat dropped. Well, you seem to be taking this news well. You don't doubt my claim? Naruto asked the happy teen. She shook her head with a bright smile. Nope, I know you're telling the truth. And how would you know this? I can tell when someone is lying to me no problem. And you've been nothing but completely honest the whole time you've been here. Besides, your aura is bright and vibrant, while also being strong and powerful. My sighed and muttered. There she goes with her troublesome aura reading again. So, you're an empath? Asked Naruto. Hmm, I guess you could say that. I mean, I was always able to tell when someone was happy or upset. But it's hard to read some people. I mean, even with you I can barely read you. All I can tell is that whatever you've said was sincere and honest. Tylee explained to him. That's pretty impressive. A natural empath at such a young age. This generation is full of promise. However, promise also comes with problems. Commented the blonde to himself. The girls were about to ask what he meant by that before they were interrupted by the arrival of a slightly elderly man in Royal Fire Nation clothing. He had an aura of calmness that both Naruto and Tylee felt, but Naruto was also able to feel the incredible power this man held back. This man is definitely not someone to underestimate. The man smiled at them and greeted, Good afternoon, girls. I hope you're having a pleasant day. Of course, Lord Iroh, Tylee replied while returning the smile. I'll admit that today's been interesting, Mai commented. I'm glad, stated the newly named Iroh before meeting Naruto's gaze. Not many knew of this but Iroh had once ventured into the spirit world years ago. During his time there, he saw visions of a young man with blonde hair battling enemies of incredible strength with the help of his friends and loved ones. The man presented himself as strong, honorable, and full of life. Based on his memories of the visions, Iroh was able to recognize the man in front of him and he gave a bow of respect. It is an honor to meet a man of your caliber, Lord Uzumaki. Naruto was surprised that the man knew his identity without him introducing himself. But then again, Lo and Lee knew who he was right away back on the ship, so he shouldn't be surprised. Please, don't bow to me. My title as hero is terribly misplaced. I don't think so, my good man. Your actions back then saved the world from a fate that many would feel is worse than death. And in the end, I left the people I swore to protect and lead after a terrible battle with a man enshrouded in darkness. I abandoned them so I'm no hero. Iroh gave the man a small smile and placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder. I believe that what you did for them was the right thing. Think about it. Did you leave out of guilt or did you leave to keep them safe? Naruto thought over the question and his actions back then. When he destroyed Yuzu in his bid to kill Sasuke, he felt immense guilt for destroying the homes of his people. But deep down, he felt as if they would be safer away from him since he was a high target back then. Even when he exiled himself to the ruins of Kanoha, he fended off many attempts on his life and defended what was left of his birth home. He gave a small smile and looked to Iroh with a small fire of determination. I left for both reasons, but the biggest one was to protect them. I may have taken away their homes, but I saved their lives in the end and homes could always be rebuilt. His smile grew along with his determined gaze as he finished, and I believe. No, I know my people survived for many years after that. Iroh nodded to him with a smile while Ty Lee, and my smiled as well. Tai Lee because she felt the sadness coming from him be replaced with happiness, and my did so because seeing him so depressed didn't suit him. When she met him, he seemed like this invincible man who could handle anything, but seeing him so vulnerable when discussing what he felt were failures didn't feel right. I'm glad I was able to help. Now, I actually came here to escort you to the test my brother set up for you. Naruto nodded and followed the man to an open arena-like area where Ozai, Zuko, Azula, and some of the citizens of the royal capital were waiting. The blonde stepped out onto the arena floor while Iroh led Mai and Tai Lee to the stands. Ozai stood up from his seat and addressed his people. We are gathered today to witness this man try and prove that he is our revered hero of the flame. This test of skill will have him perform the abilities that made him both feared and respected in the Age of Chaos. Now then, let us begin. Naruto turned his gaze to Mai and smirked before mouthing, Watch closely. At her slow nod, he took a calming breath, slowly bit his thumb to draw blood, and weaved through some hand seals before slamming his bloody palm on the ground with a cry of, Kuchiyos no Jutsu. As soon as his hand touched the ground, 
a seal array appeared and spread out before a large plume of smoke covered the entire arena. Slowly, the smoke cleared and revealed the blonde atop a giant green toad that had a pipe in its mouth, a blue coat with the kanji for chief on it, and a tanto blade on its back. The toad looked around in surprise before bellowing. What is this? Who has summoned one of the Gama clan after so many years? Naruto jumped down to the toad's nose and stared it down. I did, Gama-san. The toad narrowed its eyes at the blonde before him. And just who are you to summon me? My name is Naruto Uzumaki, Sinin of Mount Mayaboku, he replied causing the toad's eyes to widen in shock. Bai Kami-sama? You're Naruto-sama. The Grand Sinin, Gamakichi-sama, told us of your position as Sinin of the Gama clans. We believed you had disappeared off the face of the earth for eternity, yet Gamakichi-sama never lost hope since your name never faded from the list. It is an honor to meet you. I am Gamashun, chief of the Gama clan, but you may call me Shun for short. Naruto gave the toad a smile and replied, I'm glad that Kichi is still alive after so long. I'll be sure to visit him sometime. In the meantime, let the others know that Naruto Uzumaki is back. The chief toad nodded and dispelled in another plume of smoke, leaving Naruto standing in the center of the arena. The spectators all had looks of shock while Iroh had a look of amazement on his face. What's the next test? Naruto asked with his arms crossed. Or was that proof enough? Ozai scowled at him before replying, The next test is to show your mastery of your elements. First, what elements did you wield? My affinities were of lightning and wind natures. Ozai narrowed his eyes slightly at the mention of wind from Naruto. Then show us your mastery of these elements, Ozai stated as the crowd sat on the edge of their seats awaiting the display of skill. Naruto shrugged before flying through hand seals while his body emitted sparks of electricity. When he formed the final seal, he released the stored-up electricity which rose up to the heavens. Right on? Rariyudan no Jutsu? Lightning Dragon? cried the blonde as the lightning formed a serpentine dragon with crimson eyes that flew across the skies above the arena before exploding like a firework. Naruto wasn't finished as he flew through more hand seals and the wind picked up around him. The wind slowly took the form of an immense bird with glowing yellow eyes that covered Naruto with its wings. Futon, Josho Fushicho, Rising Phoenix, he cried as the wind-powered bird took to the skies and flapped its wings towards the ground below, causing gale-force winds to crash down on the ground below. While everyone in the stands covered their faces from the harsh winds, Naruto stood calm and steady as if he had experienced winds like this every day. The wind pushed the hair out of his eyes and my thought she was imagining things when she saw that his scarred right eye was shown to be blood red one. She dismissed it when the wind slowly weakened and his hair covered his right eye once again. When the winds finally died down, Naruto stood as calm as ever while the crowd looked to him with fear, respect, and awe. Ozai felt that he was convinced, but he still felt like issuing one last test to the man. You truly have mastered your elemental affinities. However, I have one final test for you. And that would be? Questioned Naruto while narrowing his visible eye. This test is for you to show that you really hold the nine-tailed spirit within you. Legends say of you having the spirit sealed inside of you. Prove it, Ozai practically ordered. Naruto narrowed his eye further before he calmed down and chuckled humorously at the man. Don't say I didn't warn you earlier, Ozai, he stated before closing his eyes and calling upon the tiniest amount of Kyuubi's power. The air soon became heavy for the spectators and they found it much harder to breathe. Naruto slowly raised his head to meet Ozai's gaze before opening his visible eye. Ozai was frozen in fear at the sight of the blood-red orb with the black, slitted pupil. Visions of death, carnage, and destruction entered his mind, and he couldn't tear his gaze away from the blonde man. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Naruto closed his eyes again, and the dense air lifted, allowing everyone to breathe easier again. Ozai released a breath he didn't know he was holding and slumped in his seat, while gazing at the blonde man in front of him with slight fear. But that fear also came with a slight gleam in his eye. This man was the real deal, and if he could get him to help in the war, then the Fire Nation's victory was assured. Clearing his throat to both calm himself and get the crowd's attention, he declared, I believe you've proven your claims, Lord Uzumaki. People of the Royal Capital, I give you our revered Hero of the Flame. It was barely a second before the crowd cheered for the blonde and praised him while Naruto stood impassively during it all. He didn't do these tests to entertain these people. He did them to prove a point to Ozai. That point was, don't ever doubt Naruto Uzumaki. While the people kept cheering, Mai watched him calmly leave the arena and head back into the royal palace. 
She hurried after him in hopes of speaking to him right away. After all, she just saw her future teacher walk away, and she'd be damned to miss an opportunity like the one he offered. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.